you want to start with in terms of a political argument or a sort of theoretical argument is that this is a landscape. Um, whatever the tragedy was that occurred that uh, led to this, this is no different to erosion, uh, the birth of elements in uh, some supernova, you name it. Uh, all of our actions and the things that happened to us are part of so-called nature. So, one of the big fights we have to start with is against the uh, <coughs> Judeo-Christian sort of uh, separation of us from everything else. So the first thing we have to sort of eliminate in any sort of real battle with survival uh, in this current age starts with um, a kind of a, a rethink of religious control. And then it leads on to dealing with a more complex system of uh, reactions to our environment than the modernist one, which is to simply be in control. Now this project was logical, a logical antithesis to classicism, uh, but once it was fully performed, uh, the minimalist box uh, was, once that was realized, it was over. And the problem with it is that it fundamentally says the wrong thing, especially for now, because it says we can be in control, we can be other to a system. It sets up uh, a framework for us to maintain a sort of a religious zealotry which is now defunct and over. If we don't fully realise that, then we're not going to survive long. I think we will survive a long time to be snuffed out as we thought we would be when I was a kid by atomic bombs. It's kind of too easy. We have a lot of suffering to do yet. Uh, a lot more invasion of space. So, the fight against this modernism and its simple geometries, its Euclidean geometries, and the embrace of complex geometries, which I think you didn't see in the previous talk, is one that's not talked about enough. So, there are architects and designers who, of course, are starting to see ways of using this sort of complexity and I don't need to do a dissertation about them. But in the end, what's fascinating with functionalism is that even through its death, it actually provides ways forward. So from an aesthetic uh, and theoretical uh, argument, when the machine actually takes over, when we have to put so much design thought into how that machine is going to get us through space, that the living function is, is sort of uh, left to last, we end up with a, a kind of an image of a, of a habitation which uh, to the staunch modernism looks horrific, but I think to the new age is really how we're going to end up seeing or not seeing architecture. So uh, whatever the catastrophe, that's going to be the aesthetic. However we are able to transform what exists into something else, that's going to be the aesthetic. So we're in this wonderful age where we're able to build and embrace the new geometries of complexity or, if you like, contingency. And that is a whole new aesthetic. I think you start to see the aesthetic in the, in the abuse of the idea of fungus and uh, the weaving of the plastics. Uh, this is not including geometry. This is a kind of a growth. And that growth is going to be incredibly useful in transforming the way we see the city. And of course, my great mentor is uh, Lewis Woods. And his proposition was that even after the catastrophe of war and battle, uh, rather than pull down the building that's been bombed like these in Sarajevo, grow new scatter like structures into the wounds and rethink those structures into something new. This is incredibly sustainable practice. It's also, it's also taking us into an aesthetic and a geometry which is very close to nature. And the end game of this theory, this sort of embrace of the slum as perhaps uh, the most beautiful architecture that you, can, that you can produce, starts to make us see the city, and these are pretty dumb aesthetics, we did the dumb images, we just put these together quickly to sort of paint a picture, but if this is what we have, Architects still grandstanding, individuated uh, sort of sites according to plot ratios and, and uh, various new styles of sort of 
curtain walling structures and still thinking that they've got a pedestal object. The city ultimately is going to be and should be subsumed into all of this stuff that will enable us to change its power systems, change its air systems, bring urban uh, agriculture back in, all the things that we need to do. And the end result will be that architecture will disappear and it will be through only the interior that we sort of perceive that we're in architecture, not the exterior. So the architecture of the city is only interesting if it becomes the fungus, um, the fungus on the wound. And we can think about design and our comfort and our happiness inside. It's like the old situationist idea that constant had uh, unitary urbanism does still live, I think, in the future. So my own research, and I've given many talks about this, but maybe you've seen stuff. You know, I just started wandering around in buildings in an Armani suit so that I could stay in there. Um, you can go anywhere with an Armani suit. Um, I sort of like the, the terrorist's mode of attire. Um, <coughs> looking for and classifying spaces in the spaces of, uh, of uh, transportation within those buildings that the public might use, there's courts and corridors and like the semi-public spaces. Classifying those and turning them into weird diagrams which were types of public space in private space, then subjecting those to um, for, know, pressures equal to the numbers of people moving through the building. And what I was looking for here was um, what does the, does the building desire to do next? Not to mimic it. This is not literal form, but to use the building's own function and types of spaces inside to provoke ideas of connection. So this turns into a quasi-science, a provocation really for urban planning thinking uh, for the future. The human race has always had a problem with brilliance or genius, you know. Uh, but the genius is only making this beautiful thing on top of the body of knowledge anyway. So, any thought is a collaboration anyway. And what we want in the end to prejudice or to have are good ideas, whether they're made by groups of people, and collaboration can be a lovely acceleration, or by one, irrelevant. But the hatred of the individual, uh, which started uh, through the death of the author in um, postmodernism, is overrated as well. So, you know, if it is an individual, so what? If it is 10 people, so what? Uh, a lot of and my whole studio invites collaboration, but good collaboration is very rare. It's like a rare, it's as rare as a good marriage uh, or a good rock group. So we mustn't lie about it, and we mustn't think that the individual genius in the, in the sort of in his little shed is irrelevant, because the most beautiful thing ever created was uh, by humans in our living memory. Is of course uh, the theory of, rel theory of relativity by Einstein, it's just a beautiful object. You can't, you can't make anything more beautiful than that. And what we need to live longer and survive the, the various catastrophes are incredibly beautiful ideas. So another fundamental of my philosophy is we have enough stuff just for the moment. Let's just rethink what that is. We've got a lot of stuff, let's deal with it. Uh, no more tabula rasa, no more uh, the idea that we can show that we're in control, let's just rearrange this stuff and rethink it. And it's incredibly exciting. Like, who, what could be better, really? It's like being a kid that's playing in a park, isn't it, the start? Uh, to invent the brand new shape, that's, it's really difficult. Uh, and you end up getting a little religious, and you become a bit of a zealot, and then you become a real bore. No matter how worthy the public art projects are, that happen in public space, they still end up being just junk in public space. So I figure the cycle really is architecture and its transformation. And it's, it's so dumb and easy. This is the building we won the Black Award for. Um, cover it in solar, power the, lab, power the uh, air conditioning, collect the water, recycle the you know, worm from the whole bit. All that stuff's really dumb. To think that's complex is not. The politics of getting this done and actually building a whole structure, you know, and going outside existing boundaries or 
not having to call it public art. It's really hard. And you've got to ask yourself, why is it that the government, and in particular the council, and the government in New South Wales, which has always been corrupt, is so particularly difficult. Sydney is fed again bread and circuses, you know, like uh, grass on the Harbour Bridge, uh, fireworks, um, laneways, even I've got seven metre bar with Russell Lowe and Adrian McGregor, it's a lot of fun. But, you yeah. know, and then it's gone. So, when we are sort of pottering around doing a lot of nice things, what we've got to remember is time's running out, you know. Uh, everyone's worried about the tide getting higher. The fact is, uh, and the man hit on the acidity thing, that's the big issue. People haven't read their history of what happens in global warming. When you use the black oil, the black oil wants to be laid down again. To be laid down, because all the rest is coal shale uh, and, and you know, stuff good enough for diesel oil. To lay down black oil, everything has to die. And everything dies this way. The ocean turns to acid, then it stops moving. The fact is that we're on a precipice of a catastrophe which is a pretty agonizing death for everybody and the whole biomass. Enough biomass to make the oil again will be laid down. That's nature's system. I think we can delay it. I, think, I really do think we can. But we can't piss about. We have to really do serious stuff. And I think the serious stuff is exquisitely simple. Get rid of the big car, buy a really little car. Don't have a swimming pool. Um, don't renovate or do something with what's existing. Never pull the building down. There are some really simple rules that catastrophically reduce the problem. Have I talked too long? Just about right. Okay, that's a bit of a break. Thank you.